Hi, this is Jim Peters with Peters Principals. As you know, we never know who we're going to have on Peters Principals, and today we have Connie Martin, school committee woman, and school committee woman hopeful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Connie, how have you been? Been very well. Absolutely, been great. Start of school, we're back in it, so things are good. That's good. Um, I, let me say, I, I, I apologize to everybody for using a computer today, but I, I, it was easier than picking up a pen and a paper, so. Um, so what is the largest crisis facing the school system today, do you think? Well, I mean, I certainly think we have a lot of challenges in front of us. I mean, always it'll come down to having, um, you know, the, the, the highest quality staff in all of the positions throughout the district. Um, you know, I always go back to if there's one single thing I could do to change the quality of education here in the city of Lowell, it would be to dramatically reduce class sizes. I think that's one thing that um, will always have the greatest impact. Of course, it's one of those things easy to say, easy to recognize, but being able to pay for it is another reality altogether. Um, so I think that, you know, as we look at kind of the the overall overcrowding that we have going on, particularly around the middle school years. Um, it really is something that we need to really constantly be trying to reduce and reduce and reduce those numbers. Um, many years ago, uh, we had had in place, and it was through a, a, a federal grant, a Classroom Size Reduction Act uh, was the name of the, the funding. And it allowed us to double up teachers within a classroom so that even if you had a larger classroom, uh, you still were able to have two teachers functioning within it, which gave you the impact of having a smaller class size. Right. Um, I think in a district like ours where our, um, our schools are just, you know, kind of full to the brim, um, that's our best option to be able to get the, the benefit of uh, smaller class sizes without having to suddenly build 20 new classrooms. Right. Um, so it's certainly something that uh, remains at the front of my mind when we go through all of our decision making. The, uh, uh, well, this is just a, 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 a quick question. Can you comment on the preliminary election? Um, well, you know, I think that perhaps the most important comment is it's preliminary. <laughs> right. uh, and that's important for everyone to realize. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, there were certainly some surprising results that I, I had not been expecting. Um, but I do think that it is, preliminaries are by their very nature kind of rarefied um, events. Uh, so I don't think it's wise to put, uh, to consider it anything a done deal. A lot can happen in the next few weeks between, you know, September and November. Um, and I suspect it will. And I suspect that you'll see a lot of candidates working extremely hard, um, no matter where they finished on the, kind of in the, the rankings, um, because it's an important job. And getting onto the city council requires a great deal of work. Um, certainly true for the school committee as well. Uh, but they do get a bit of a, you know, canary in the coal mine kind of head start when right. when there's a preliminary and you're able to at least gauge somewhat what kind of public sentiment and what the voters are thinking. I can't gauge based on what I've seen this morning uh, what the voters are thinking. I mean, it's 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 too difficult to it's too difficult to understand. Um, but it, I, I, I have to admit that I like the uh, result in, in terms of uh, what it was saying about the high school downtown mm -hmm. and uh, people were very committed to the uh, seemed to be committed to the high school downtown which which I thought was great I mean that did seem to be kind of the message that you know if you looked at kind of where people had fallen in the ranking so yeah but that, early days <laughs> well it is early, yeah that's true it is early days but um, I don't think I'm going to launch into my uh, uh, Facebook comments okay. immediately. <laughs> so, um, so how, but based on what we saw yesterday, how does that look for the the uh, high school being downtown? Well, I mean, I do think that looking at um, 
you know, kind of just, you know, everyone has pretty much been clear about their intentions and their preferences across the board in the council race. You know, just by numbers, I think it showed that there was a very strong support for a downtown, for the downtown location. So, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I do think that was certainly the message I took from it. Um, the question will be if that, if that bears out you know, six weeks from now. That's true. It, yeah. we, we, it is six weeks from now. Um, this is kind of a loaded, a loaded question. What are your What are your broad hopes for the school committee? Because I, I don't, let me just give you an example. We tested two hundred sixty five on the uh, uh, on, a, on a, some standardized test. I'm not sure which standardized test mm -hmm. it was. Uh, out, out of the 370 or so yeah. cities and towns that are in the district, right. and uh, we t we tested uh, very what I would consider to be poorly. What do we have to do to bring that up? I think there's a. It's obviously a complicated uh, answer. Um, you know, part of it does fall in the the reality of the the test itself. It is this past year we did do the park test for the first time. Um, that was a departure from MCAS. Um, coming up in this next year, it's still at least being discussed that we'll be going to an MCAS 2.0, which is kind of a hybrid, supposedly, of, of PARC and MCAS. Um, with the death, death of uh, Commissioner uh, um, Chester, I don't know where that stands right now. I haven't heard any updated information um, with his passing because he was such a strong proponent of that. Um, but I think that you know part of it is the reality of our population. You know, we get every student in the district is goes through the standardized te standardized tests. Uh, you have students who are on IEPs, part of our special needs population. You have English language learners. You have new refugees and immigrants, uh, and these are all you know they're called special populations. Uh, by the state, and it's recognized that they have greater challenges. That um, at, that the a straight standardized test is never gonna um, be be equal for them or fair for them. Uh, but they are included in our overall numbers, and I think that that's just part of our reality. I mean, I accept that. Uh, it just means that we need to take it into consideration when we're making comparisons. So when we're compared to like districts, urban districts like Springfield and Worcester, um, you'll see that that Lowell finishes quite well. We're always above the median. We're always, right. yeah, absolutely. When when you pull out, and it's a, you know, again, it's. I look at it as context, but I, I can recognize that other people may not. But when I look at it and compare apples to apples, uh, we'll always be above the midline um, and have been um, when those comparisons are made to like urban districts. There's just something that Dr. Kafawi just told me a few, a few uh, about an hour ago, and we were talking about uh, people being on the uh, School committee and, and the fact that the school committee is a very powerful when, when when working with itself and and coming up with six or so votes and things like seven mm -hmm. double votes and things things like that. Um, we um, he he said we have a very strong school committee, and uh, I was just wondering if you could comment on that. You know, I think that um, the school committee certainly has. Um, I think work together well. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we've had some. Uh, you know, obviously we have different perspectives on a lot right. of different things. That's the beauty of it. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, that you're able to kind of be able to express different ideas and hopefully come to a, a conclusion and a resolution that's what's best for the for the overall district. Um, so you know, I would agree with that. I think that we can. Uh, you know, the best kind of school committees really are the ones that are. Um, actively working to get new information, um, you know, ask the right questions, get the right answers so that we can make the best decisions. And that's incumbent on the, on each member of the school committee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by nature to serve in this position, I think you need to be kind of profoundly curious um, about what's going on in the district, what's going on in education in general, mm -hmm. uh, being able to take those different information sources and be able to really kind of translate them into Lowell uh, so that we get the benefit of it. And I think that a school committee that is uh, always questioning and always uh, demanding that we get uh, accurate and, and um, quality information are the ones that will make the best decisions. So, I, th I think that um, 
I, I, I noticed something when, when I'm doing my history of all edu educational system yeah. project, and I'm trying to put a, put a book together. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, there are a lot of um, courses that were taught academically back in the 1830s that are still taught yeah. academically today, yeah. like uh, German, French, uh, mm -hmm. en English, um, of, of, of course, and uh, and uh, also fr um, Latin mm -hmm. is, is still taught to a certain degree, yeah. and uh, also also courses on geography, history, and, mm -hmm. and that, that type of thing. Um, are we stuck in a um, some sort of Time machine that we can't get out of, or or, or 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 is this a normal part of the educational process? I think it's a normal part of the educational process. There are foundation points that need that every student is going to need, um, and kind of need to know and have mastery of things like English, um, things like understanding. You know, understanding another language um, is is a huge benefit for for students. I think the kind of general um, academic topics probably don't change that much. I mean, it's history, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic. I mean, these are all things that are uh, still fundamental to being successful in our in our world. Um, but without question, the way we teach these things has changed profoundly. Um, you know, you're no longer sitting in a classroom with a teacher at the front just kind of lecturing and a hardcover book in front of you right. that, you know, that just kind of lays out the facts. We're much more driven by interactive experiences. Uh, we rely far more on technology. Um, you know, you'll find fewer and fewer books in our schools because we're using more and more of um, high-tech resources right. to both in terms of the way we teach and the content that we teach. So it's uh, you know it's certainly a different world, um, and I think that that's important because the way we learn has changed, and certainly the way children learn has changed. Um, and you know, so our, our effectiveness um, needs to be something we constantly challenge. But I think in terms of content, some of those things are just things you're always going to need to know. I think so too. I mean, when I look through, um, I, I have this saying that there, there are four places that you should go for quotes. Shakespeare, Mark Twain, uh, the Bible, and uh, someplace else. I'll, I'll, I'll remember <laughs> where it is. Um, but uh, that, that, that's just my feeling about it. Um, kind of interesting just thinking that things are that much the same but that different. The more things change, right. <laughs> the more they stay the same. Yeah. Uh, the, the use of uh, computers in the classroom has really changed the computer, uh, the, uh, the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I was in uh, a, uh, an English classroom last week and the kids were henpecking <laughs> on the uh, computer, and uh, I took a few of them and I said, "Now I want you to put your hands on ASDF and, oh, yeah. and JKL semicolon." <laughs> and uh, some of them actually went to a program that had been written like okay. that, and and uh, used the program to learn how to type. There you go. So. It was incredible. I mean, I, I, I thought I was going to be up there going ASDF. Yeah, no. Yeah. And uh, instead, they're on this program doing their own stuff, thing, <laughs> and, and they found the program themselves. So I was really shocked. I mean, that's no. technology. Absolutely, and it's a it's a kind of comfort with technology that certainly kids have today. That you know. For the rest of us grown-ups, it's not quite so natural. But I mean, they're you know they're they have a question, they have a go-to. They'll go to whether it's Google or any of these other search engines. If they need to learn something, they'll find an app for that. I mean, that's just the the way the world they're growing up in, mm. um, and it it does it it's really remarkable, and it's I think will really lead to a a generation that is in addition to being very technically savvy. Um, will be really demanding in terms of uh, information and how they get it and how quickly they get it and I think that will that will have some profound changes in our in our world that's probably true um, it did this this is just something that that uh, uh, I found amazing how did you get a pay raise through the, through the city council 
I, I mean, they <laughs> we didn't have much to, to do with it. <laughs> they weren't going to do anything, and then all of a sudden there was a pay raise for the for the teachers and uh -huh. the parents. And I was just curious as to what happened. Well, I mean, we'd been in negotiations for quite a while. Obviously, when we when we finalized our contract, uh, our most recent contract, there was a full year without anything, because um, we basically basically did a one year deal, which was you know for no raise, because that year had pretty much already passed. Right, right. Uh, and then we did a three year contract for the three years moving forward. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a challenge, and it is. Um, it, it can be really scary when you go through this process because you're committing to um, millions and millions of extra dollars um, and you have to be able to do it in a way that shows you know we want to maintain our quality workforce that is we will live and die by the quality of teachers in our classrooms we want to be able to pay them a, a, a strong strong wage that keeps them in our district doing good work um, I do believe that's profoundly important um, and I think that when you know and then on the flip side of that that the reality is is that once we make that commitment it's a commitment and the school committee is honor bound to stand up for it right. so you know the reality is is that you know three months from now we could get a 9c cut from the governor that could destroy our budget for the year that's life that that's life in a in Massachusetts that's life anywhere in in this nation uh, you know tax revenues don't come in the way they are expected or some other crisis happens uh, at the state level and every municipality in the Commonwealth could could get a 9c cut um, when that happens and it has happened um, the only you know the only option for the school committee is to be incredibly thoughtful and discerning in where we make cuts and making cuts has unfortunately become just a natural part of our process every budget season we do it um, since I first came on this committee many years ago um, I mean every year we've had to make cuts some have been more reasonable some years have been really quite honestly right. devastating right. Um, but that's the job right. and that's when it's important that you really understand your district that you really understand what's going on at every level so that as you're making these really tough decisions they're grounded in fact um, and they're they're recognizing that there is a price to pay that when you lose something from your school district um, not only are students losing something and families losing something, your community is losing something. Because, mm. you know, we all live and die by, by the, the quality of education in our schools, no matter if you have kids in the district or not. I, I think that's right. I think that we do. Um, I, I just had a grandchild, and uh, uh, I, I, the first thing I thought about was, you know, where is he going to be educated? and what's Yeah, I mean, that's it. What's more important than that? Nothing. Um, oh, I, I, I want to ask this question because I think it's important. Are paras going to become better paid because they're, they're really on the bottom end of the scale? They absolutely are. I hope so. I mean, I think that we made some moves in this, this contract. Um, and I'm hoping that as, you know, and part of what's happened in the last, say, maybe, I don't know, maybe eight to ten years, is that the the power provision, the power position has changed over time. We are more demanding in terms of a prereqs, um, so that people are coming in with a higher education level, um, which I think uh, professionalizes the job, which right. I think is a positive move. Um, and I think for every para that's working in our district, we get an amazing value for what they're doing in the classrooms, the way they're supporting teachers, and the way they're supporting students. Um, and they do a lot of different you know there are a lot of different roles that paras play mm -hmm. so they have a level of flexibility um, in some ways that's unheard of <laughs> uh, in, a, in a, a kind of education environment so you know it's something that we discuss as a committee certainly um, what the you know the the real value that we get for our paraprofessionals and our desire to, to always continue to try and support them if and when paras become better paid how do you see the negotiations going um, you know, I think that it will, it's something that you, you hope will happen over time. Um, so I think that, you know, generally ways that we're able to um, make um, 
kind of significant changes to salary levels generally be when we're able to fold in like a, a higher degree level requirement or a specific training maybe requirement. Uh, so that may be something that we, we look at over time. Again, we're right at the beginning now of a three-year uh, contract, so that will play out over, over these three years. Um, but it's always something that we're kind of paying attention to. I, I just feel badly for them because I know how hard they work. They work very hard. And uh, they, they're, they're really teachers in a cert, to a certain fashion, mm -hmm. in a certain fashion. And, well, they make teaching possible, I think, they, in a lot right, of environments. They, they, they make it they, a lot they made the teach, difference, right? absolutely. And uh, I just feel badly for them that they, they uh, have to uh, endure what really is not a living wage. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have, I've got a question for you. I don't know quite how to ask it, but mm -hmm. how do you see your relationship with the new principals? It seems like we have a lot of new principals. We do have quite a few new principals. Um, it's uh, it's interesting time right now. I mean, we, we have seen a dramatic um, change in the, the um, kind of cadre of, of individuals who are leading our, our schools, uh, both principals and assistant principals, there's been a great deal of movement. Um, for myself, I've always found the principals to be a, a great resource in terms of my own education mm -hmm. uh, and my own education about what's going on in the district and, and better understanding individual schools. Uh, every few years I do a full sweep right. uh, and I do a, a school visit to every school. Um, my plan is that if I'm lucky enough to get reelected this year, uh, my plan would be in January. I always try to do it before we hit budget season mm -hmm. um, so that you can kind of have an opportunity, as I, I say to all the principals I've met with over the years, um, I really value the opportunity to have a conversation with, with principals, new and old, to get their take on, on how they feel things are going in their schools, to get their opinions on what uh, new investments, you know, again, why I try to go before budget seasons is so if there are specific things that they feel they need or that perhaps they don't need, that they, you know, as they're looking at their own budgets, um, where they see, uh, you know, some needs for additional attention right. and whatnot. Um, and I also, and it's been borne out many, many years. I mean, the first time I did this was literally when I had gotten elected in November. I had completed my round of visits before I was sworn in in January. Uh, and from that very first time, I had said to all the principals who I met with, you know, for me, the key is meeting you, getting to know you before there's a crisis. Right. So that it's not a matter of, uh, you know, hearing about something happening at a school, not having a sense of the leadership, not having a sense of uh, who's in charge, because um, that's really um, you can't, again, you don't have the right information. Mm -hmm. you know, so if there is a real problem, if there is a real crisis, uh, it's always, I've always found it really important to know who the leadership is, um, have an understanding and, a, and a, a appreciation for uh, the work they do so that you're not meeting someone when, you know, when the walls are falling down. Yeah, well, it's important. <laughs> um, we've uh, actually run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd like to wish you luck in the election, and I hope you, uh, I, I hope it's good for you. Very kind of you. I appreciate the invite. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you. This has been Jim Peters with Peters Principles, and uh, you never know who we're going to have on. So there you have it. <laughs>